So this first session is going to be 45 minutes long for their discussion and then 10 minutes for Q&A. I will let you know when the time is for that. I wouldn't be surprised in 10 years if you have like holograms sitting. Seriously, that'd be cool. That'd be cool. suppose we can help. Okay. Hmm. All right. Thank you, Rachel, for that warm and kind introduction. So, to know the truth, we must risk it all. Heard it at Techno Matrix. Anybody seen that movie? If not, it's a good one. While we all want to know the truth, and humanity has made a decision to build the metaverse, before we move fast, we must understand the risks in order to safely navigate these new realities that we are building. Today, it's such an honor for me to facilitate and be a part of this really great discussion we're about to have with this all-women panel. I'd like to welcome all of you and my fellow panelists. We have Anne, who is also remotely joining us, um, who have vastly different background from each other, and oftentimes, we know that we have different opinions. But what makes this panel so, so interesting is exactly this. It is such an important time for us to come together, exchange ideas, and share knowledge, simply because safety in the metaverse is just that important. So. Without further ado, I'm going to hand over the, the, the mic to these wonderful ladies. And let's start with Anne. Anne, are you with us? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> Go ahead, please. I will. Uh Thanks, Kavya, for moderating this panel and for including me in this discussion. I'm really excited to virtually be here. Uh, I'm on the Reality Labs policy team, and I focus on VR and the Metaverse product group. Some examples of the experiences that I work on include Horizon Worlds and, and Echo VR. And before coming to, to Meta, I worked on technology policy uh, in DC and at an academic research center. I'm actually currently finishing a doctorate in economics at George Mason University. And a major area for focus for me was governance. And this, this word means the rule sets and the institutions and the processes that moderate behavior. Um, I actually jumped into VR set as, or VR chat as part of my research. And that experience led me to writing about um, the layers of rules that make up that space, formal and informal. And that includes the EULA, the code of conduct, social norms, reputation mechanisms like trust rankings, and all of these factors combined um, enable better experiences for people. Doing this type of research is why I applied to work for Meta. Um, but my original interest in these topics began um, really because of uh, playing video games with my brother and friends growing up, specifically World of Warcraft, Mario Kart, uh, Pokemon games, uh, and also from science fiction. So I read a lot of science fiction, including the classics for VR like Snow Crash and Ready Player One, but also some of the more distinct um, or not, not very obvious um, examples, like, like the VR use cases in Three Body Problem or augmented reality use cases in Rainbow's End. And really, I, I fell in love with VR for a variety of reasons. So I'd love to go in, into that for, for a bit here. Uh, the first is the experiential element. So the ability to defy distance um, and also to enable social connection as well. 
Um, one of my first jobs was in experiential education, actually. So the thing that struck me from that experience was the ability of the outdoors to enchant and challenge and empower people. And um, you know, other, the other aspects, social connection and a sense of social presence, I experienced very viscerally during COVID because I wasn't able to see people. And I actually spent a lot of time during COVID um, pregnant. And I found that VR hangouts were really the next best thing. We would hop into VR chat and, and, and have a lot of fun. And there was one world that we found that was a beach world. We found an exploit where if you uh, picked up a certain item, it would fling you into the sky. And, and this became hilarious because people would be having a normal conversation, press this button, and then spatial audio would mean that you hear them um, make ridiculous noises as they get shot up into the sky. Um, and these are examples of some of those like embodied moments that really make VR meaningful to me. Uh, I'll pass it back over to others. Thank you, Anne, and congratulations on motherhood. And uh, couldn't agree more with you. And likewise, I would love to hear from you, Joan, a uh, little bit of, about, about yourself. And it, how, how did you fall in love with XR? Um, yeah, I'm Joan O'Hara. I'm vice president of public policy with the XR Association. Uh, we are a fairly new trade association representing um, the broad ecosystem of XR. Uh, we started off representing um, the major man manufacturers, but we've recently expanded and now um, include also uh, developers, end users, um, et cetera. So we're, we're very excited about not only this conference and seeing the, the enthusiasm and all of the developments that are happening these days, um, but just to be around people who have so much enthusiasm and see the promise of this technology. Um, I spend a lot of my time talking to policymakers and lawmakers on Capitol Hill and um, at the White House, and I'm, I'm often challenged to explain to them what something like a metaverse would look like. Um, their experience with VR and AR tends to be in sort of the entertain entertainment and gaming space. Um, so part of what I do is to try and help them understand that that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, the enterprise uses for this technology, um, applications in health and medicine, uh, manufacturing, uh, the implications for the economy, all of that is so important and it really touches on um, what many congressional representatives are interested in anyway from a constituent standpoint. Um, so to be able to help them understand how this next iteration of the internet, how this amazing new technology is going to help uh, advance some of their interests and solve some of our problems is a really exciting opportunity. Um, but that's just part of what we do at XRA. Um, my colleague Laura Chadwick um, had a panel earlier today um, talking about surveys that we recently conducted um, looking at uh, how Euro the Europeans are thinking about XR, what steps they're taking, what challenges and opportunities they encounter. Um, but we're really excited that people are beyond just the people at this convention center are starting to really recognize the potential of this technology. Um, for myself, I'm a, I'm a very vivid dreamer, um, and I mean that in the literal sense. Like when I dream, I always remember it, and it's always really interesting to the point where I look forward to going to sleep because I'm like, ooh, what am I going to do tonight? Like seriously, <laughs> it's, it's, it's fun. Um, and the first time I put on a, an HMD, I felt like I had stepped into a dream. That's what it most reminded me of. Like I was in a, a different world, a different sort of reality, um, but it was very vivid and I could engage with it. Um, so it, it really did have that sort of a magical sense for me, unlike anything else I had ever experienced. So, um, you know, obviously all of the, uh, the applications and the uses of this technology are what we're here to discuss and, and are so important, but, but that magical element just uh, has continued to capture my imagination. Fantastic. Thank you, Joan. And let's go over to Elise. What made you fall in love with VR, XR, and then, of course, a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. My name is Elise Dick. I'm a policy analyst at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Uh, we're a tech, and policy, a tech policy think tank in Washington, D.C., where we conduct uh, research at the intersection of innovation and public policy. So what that means in practice is that we're working with industry leaders as well as policymakers to identify where laws and governance can play a role in shaping innovation and working toward the future. Specifically, I run our AR VR work stream at ITIF, so I'm working with fantastic people like Joan and Kavya 
as well as policymakers and lawmakers in DC and at the state level to figure out how we can shape a regulatory environment that will enable an immersive future and also protect people in this new metaverse. So that includes things including privacy, uh, personal safety, physical safety, but also how we're going to use this technology as a society. How will it change education? What do we need to do to empower educators, parents, and administrators to make that happen? How will it create economic opportunities? And how can we empower employers to create those opportunities for their employees? These are the kinds of questions that I'm working on every day and putting out reports and events and other information uh, to try to, like Jones said, raise awareness that this is more than just gaming and that it's something we need to think of now. This isn't some science fiction future concept. Uh, it's changing the world today and policy needs to, to meet this moment. Uh, I fell in love with XR, well really my first immersive experience. In college, I worked at a planetarium. Uh, I did not know anything about science and I'm very bad at math, but they let me in uh, and they let me run shows. And the moment of sitting in that dome and being able to fly up to Jupiter and fly through the great red spot was just the coolest thing I thought I'd ever seen. And being able especially to show that to kids who really felt like they were there and I could see the excitement in their faces was so gratifying. I thought that was the coolest thing ever and then I tried VR. And I was just blown away by the potential of this technology to educate, to inform, to engage. You know, gaming is great and entertainment is great, but I, I really understood that this was an opportunity to experience the world and share information and experiences with each other in a way that we'd never been able to before. So my work at ITIF really tries to grab that potential and make sure that we're putting the safeguards we need in place to be able to reach it without uh, experiencing perhaps some of the pitfalls that we have with other forms of communication technologies. Wonderful. Thank you, Elise. And uh, I want to talk about just a, just a little bit about how I fell in love with XR. Um, some of you may know I was working for Meta, now Meta, but Facebook back in 2016, doing third party security during US presidential election time. Um, um, back in, uh, in the audience, uh, my former boss, Tomas, is sitting there. Hey, Tomas. So together we would evaluate the risks of you know, vendors coming through the front door. And uh, some of those elements were related to Oculus, uh, uh, which is now also renamed. But move fast forward. Um, uh, after leaving Facebook, I became the head of security for Linden Lab. Uh, as you, some of you may know, they are the creators of Second Life, the oldest existing virtual world. And that's when I spent about eight and a half to 10 hours every single day in VR trying to build this other virtual reality platform and realized, wow, you can connect with people in such compelling ways and oftentimes confronted with very difficult situations where people were just like, you know, swearing words and stuff. So then over time, it just simply became my passion to try to secure these new realities that people will be building and here we are. And I just wanna give a shout out to everybody from XRSI. Where are you guys at? <laughs> All of us, I, we've brought an army of rebels <laughs> along with us. But let's get back to the important question. And for that question, first I want to pull up this slide uh, from you know, what is our understanding. Recently we conducted some research um, with MITRE Corporation and tried to understand and establish what is potentially the metaverse and the layers of it. But to really dive into it, I want to go to Anne from Meta as to what exactly is the metaverse. XRSI, you know, this is the XRSI understanding of the metaverse. So as I understand, it's like it would evolve, you know, it will evolve based on the convergence of several technologies and experiences, you know, AR, VR, 5G, AI, edge networks, all of these things. But so, Anne, I want to get back to you as to what is your understanding as you're, you know, leading uh, these uh, conversations and trying to establish for everybody else how to even secure and safely navigate this. Thanks, Kavya. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, the metaverse itself is a set of digital spaces where you can share immersive experiences with others. 
And these experiences will be interconnected so you can easily move between them. They're going to rely on the use of a lot of different devices, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of different surfaces. Uh, it lets you do things that you wouldn't be able to do in the physical world as well. So one of my favorite examples of this is how in a lot of VR use cases, gravity can be optional. You can, you can take an object and throw it forever, and that's a, that is a possibility. Um, another aspect of this is, is you, can, you can be with people that you can't physically be in the, in the real world. Um, and in my experience, when you can't be there in person, VR has, has sort of filled in as the next best thing. Um, I also think of this in terms of like what this might look like. So for me, uh, it would mean hanging out with friends in VR chat playing Minesweeper game, for example, uh, and then being able to receive a call from my mom and being embodied, um, being able to be embodied in, in a hologram in her living room to have that conversation and then seamlessly be able to move back to the experience that I was having before. Um, it's really the next evolution of, of social technologies and, and the successor to the mobile internet. I wanna also highlight that, that this is a, a long journey and, and the innovations aren't going to happen overnight. So many of these products uh, and use cases, especially like AR, VR, will only be fully realized in, in 10 or maybe 15 years. Um, and the other piece of this is uh, Meta as a company is, is neither going to build, own or run the metaverse on its own. And, and that's why we think it's super important to be collaborating at every stage with the folks in this room, with the folks on this panel um, and with companies and developers and experts and policy makers. So I can speak a bit to, to how we're going to do that um, as well. Wonderful. So would it be fair to say then the metaverse represents this interoperability between diverse spatial systems allowing for the flow of users, data, commerce, culture across three dimensional spaces, which may be you know, it could involve various different actors. And uh, I, I hear you say, you know, it's not just meta. There is like a lot of different actors that will bring these technologies and they will converge. And uh, uh, what do you think, you know, that would it be fair to say that there will be so many more actors involved as we build this metaverse? Yeah, one, one very uh, interesting example of this that I saw today is the Seoul municipal government is looking to build a municipal version of the metaverse, sort of a, a public square that's accessible to, to the people that are, are in Seoul um, and perhaps others. And, and that's the kind of example of, of other aspects that could plug into to what we are, are, are building as well. Great. And so as we build this, I want to ask you, Elise, how it is going to, how is it going to impact our social lives and just in general society and culture? Well, as Joan already said, um, you know, it's not just gaming, and I think that's the important thing we need to think about when we're talking about building the metaverse. We're not talking about people just jumping in to play a multiplayer game in a three-dimensional space. We're talking about something that is going to have a massive impact on all of society and not just the people who are actually in those spaces. This is going to impact everyone. So even people who may never put on a headset are going to be impacted by the metaverse. We need to be thinking about things like bystander privacy with augmented reality, and even privacy when we're talking about things like spatial mapping and virtual reality. Uh, people will be swept up in the metaverse even if they are not voluntarily entering it. And so we, when we talk about how the metaverse is going to impact society, we really do need to look at society as a whole, not a microcosm of society that we think the metaverse will be. So privacy is obviously a huge issue to look at. Uh, the privacy of the users, the privacy of those around them, uh, and the privacy of information that is flowing back and forth in these spaces. Uh, physical safety, making sure people are safe in the physical world when they have one foot in the virtual world. Uh, and again, making sure that those people aren't harming others around them who might have more spatial awareness than they do. Uh, and also opportunity. We need to make sure that those who do want to be a part of the metaverse and actually enter these virtual spaces have the ability to do so and have the ability to gain new opportunities, whether that be economic opportunity from working somewhere where they might otherwise have to commute over vast distances or accessing spaces that they wouldn't otherwise be able to because of mobility challenges. So when we're thinking about how it impacts society as a whole, we really want to think about you know, what goals can the metaverse help us reach, and how can we take advantage of these technologies to get us there? But at the same time, who might be harmed along the way, and how can we make sure that they are sort of off of this path so that they're not going to be run over as we 
go full steam ahead uh, into an immersive future. Wow. And there is so much to think about, unpack, and that is precisely why we are you know, together in this, trying to wrap our heads around. So Joan, I want to go to you about, you know, you're over there in DC along with Elise, like what are your opinions about what are the unintended consequences and risks that might come along with this technology? Well, I think we've learned a lot from the creation and evolution of the internet over the past decades. Um, and, and, and social media as well. Um, and there are a lot of lessons learned there. So that's a positive thing as we move forward. Um, you know, there will always be unintended consequences, but I, I think we got a little bit of a preview of some things that we need to keep an eye on um, as we continue to build out the, the metaverse or the XR space, um, including, as Elise mentioned, um, user safety, uh, user privacy, uh, conduct, uh, what kind of content is out there, the well-being of the user. Um, you know, as the metaverse, you know, and, and we're just using that term now because everyone knows what that means, it, we, it remains to be seen how it, how it fully develops and matures. Um, but, it, you know, there are going to be new challenges there. And it, others at this conference have spoken about uh, Snow Crash and uh, Ready Player One and other sort of science fiction versions of what we're talking about now. Um, and I think a key difference there was that, that those concepts were based on um, a dystopian reality, that, that the world had become a really unpleasant, unhealthy, unsafe place to be. So you had to sort of escape into a virtual world. Um, that's not what we're looking at here, uh, hopefully. Um, so it's, I think it's very important that this uh, technology becomes a supplement to real life, uh, becomes a way to connect people, not to divide them. Um, to help us to overcome uh, potential divides, whether those are uh, geographic divides, um, you know, physical space, 3,000 miles away, uh, cultural differences, um, age, age differences, generational differences. Hopefully this will be a tool that can help bring us together in a lot of ways. Uh, but it should never be a replacement for interpersonal interaction and, and the real world. Um, so I think, you know, we're in a good place right now to think about what we want this to be. What role is it going to play? Um, and as we sort of map that out, we can, we can see where there might be risks, where there could be harms. But because we're talking about this now, um, at the very beginning, I think we're in a really good place to address some of these concerns so that when this technology is fully mature, um, it's a really safe, productive, healthy place to be. Totally. And I would have to agree with you there, John, Joan, because um, there is these unintended consequences that we also deeply looked at at XRSI. And I just want to you know, sh show that slide there. Uh, the understanding of these real world challenges where we would have, you know, especially when you look at the global stage, diversity and inclusion, you know, when, when we are going to extend reality, are we really bringing everyone with it, you know, every representation, color, creed, accessibility, digital divide. I mean, do we want to have these sort of a haves and the have-nots of the caste system sort of come in? Identity protection. Personally, for me, you know, it's, it's really, really important that, you know, people are not targeted or murdered because of who they are or what they look like or what they represented their avatar as. Um, privacy and uh, you know, safety and security, all of this. So it, it, is a, it is a huge challenge to combat. And there, there is, Meta has sort of kind of given us the glimpses at Facebook Connect and talked about it. So, and I wanna ask you like, between these challenges that, you know, we are thinking about it at XRSI, like, how are we going to deal with it? Are, are you seeing similar challenges occur? And then how is Meta preparing for this at your end? Yes, I, I love that you called out these areas. There's a lot of parallels um, to how we're thinking and focusing on this. So uh, one thing I want to, to mention is there are a few areas that we have committed to working with others to anticipate risk 
um, identify questions and, and get it right. And so these include economic opportunity and that's how we give people more choice and encourage competition and maintain a, a digital economy. Um, it's privacy, how we can minimize the amount of data that's used and give people transparency and control over their, that data. And it's also safety and integrity, how we can keep people safe online, give them tools to take action and, and get help if they see something or experience something they're not comfortable with. Um, and a last area is, I'll mention is equity and inclusion. So how can we make sure that these technologies are designed inclusively and in a way that's accessible? And one of the ways that, that we are doing that is by investing in um, an XR fund. Uh, this is a two-year investment, it's about $50 million. Um, and it really looks at research and programs that can help us build the metaverse responsibly um, with a key focus on these questions around these, issues, these hard issue areas that we're going to have to keep exploring. Um, so for example, with this fund, uh, we're going to be facilitating independent external research. And, and one of the institutions we're working with is University of Hong Kong, and they're focused on safety ethics and responsible design. Um, so I'm excited to see what comes out of, of their work. And I also just want to point out, you know, uh, you, you talk, we, earlier when we discussed, we talked about some of the responsible innovation principle. So how does that play out uh, with respect to the metaverse, uh, Anne? Yeah, I, I love that you asked this as well. So um, one of these principles, consider everyone. So just like when the, the camera was invented and, and society established norms around when it was appropriate to take photos, we also need to consider, as Elise mentioned, the people that aren't using our products. Um, and we can do things like add indicators to, to cameras that, that are taking photos. Um, another area is, is never surprise people. So that means really being transparent about how our products work and the data that they collect. Uh, one way we do this on, in VR is, is the Oculus Safety Center where we have tips and, and guidelines and explanations of our rating system as well. Um, another is, is put people first. So this to me is critical in enabling people to participate in that economic opportunity. So I think of creators in Horizon um, and creators in, for example, Spark AR. Um, being able eventually to, to sort of build upon the, those brands and the, those products. Um, and, and yeah, like th this is how we're thinking about it every step of the way. Um, so I'd love, and we announced these last year, but I, I would have loved if, if we could get more fit feedback on these and, and examples of how they, they can apply because it's something I think about every day. So great to hear that we are proactively thinking about it, you know, whether it is a private corporation whether it's nonprofit like XRSI, but then I want to go to Joan, ask, you know, at the policy level, how are we going to safely navigate the metaverse, the extended realities? I think one of the uh, most important aspects of taking on this challenge is bringing a lot of voices to the table. So it can't just be policymakers, it can't just be industry voices, it can't just be civil society, it can't just be scientists, it needs to be all of us talking to each other. Um, the XR Association, where, you know, who I represent today, um, has recently announced the formation of the XR Advisory Council. Um, and this, it, we, we are still in the process of putting it all together and, and uh, inviting folks to join. But the, the point is to start anticipating these difficult questions and policy challenges now. Um, you know, we, we've already talked about some of them. Privacy certainly is going to be a big one, especially with, uh, with the collection of biometric data, which is, you know, different than just information about you. It's in information about who you are. Um, so there are some really significant and important policy challenges um, and questions around governance. And, you know, as Anne said at the beginning of, of our talk today, um, Meta wants to work with a lot of different companies, from the big tech players to some of the smaller companies and developers. Um, that's going to mean compromises on, on a lot of uh, you know, different aspects of the development. It's going to mean um, collaboration, sharing information. And one of the things that, uh, that we're all going to have to agree on, I think, is uh, some basic terms of governance. Um, what are our values? What, what values do we want to imbue the metaverse with? Um, and how are we going to do that? So with our XR Advisory Council, um, we're bringing in industry people, we're bringing in uh, law and policy makers, we're bringing in folks from the government, we're bringing in um, 
friends from civil society, from think tanks, uh, academics. We, we really want to get the perspective um, from a 360 degree view. And I think, um, you know, that's just one example. It's something that we're doing at XRA. Um, but I think more broadly, as a, as a society, as a community, that we, we really need to be open-minded, um, hear different perspectives, be open to opinions and uh, challenges that we may not have thought of ourselves. Um, but, you know, I, I'm very optimistic because I feel like we're starting these conversations early. Um, I think, I mean, maybe I'm overly optimistic, but I think everyone wants this technology to succeed and to be a positive for society. So with that ultimate goal in common, I think we can get there. But, uh, but the biggest takeaway, I guess, from, from your question is that it needs to be an ongoing conversation and it needs to incorporate all of the voices talking to each other. Multidisciplinary. Yep, Love absolutely. That. Yeah. And Elise, I mean, what is your opinion on that very same question that we're gathered here today for how are we going to safely navigate this? I mean, I'll absolutely echo Joan's point that it has to be a whole of society approach and we have to make sure the right people are in the room. I would also say we need ways to actually operationalize that. Uh, we need to make sure that we have systems in place and we have practices in place to bring diverse voices in at the beginning of product development, for example. Uh, really think about how, instead of just saying we're bringing people in, do things like XRA is doing and like other like XRSI and other folks that are working in this space to really make sure we are intentionally bringing other people to the table. I also think, again, working with policymakers is going to be critical. And I, one of the issues that I've run into working with policy stakeholders is there's still really not an understanding of the technology. So just as a short-term goal, we need to make sure that policymakers and the people who are shaping the laws and regulations around this technology not only understand its future potential, but also that it exists now and that the, a lot of the use cases that we're talking about are possible now. So we really need to make sure that we're bringing everyone up to speed with the capabilities of these technologies. Thank you. And then, you know, we are uh, moving towards the conclusion. The last 10 minutes is reserved for the audience. We really want to hear from you and sort of, you know, respond to any questions. Uh, but I still have like three, four minutes. Uh, I want to just go back to Anne. Any conclusion thoughts or takeaway for the audience, Anne, at this point? Yeah, so I mentioned that collaboration piece. I think this is where we're, we're going to have to focus on, on a few things. So we're at the beginning of that long journey. Um, if you have input, we, we want to hear it. Uh, so Jordan from my team is at the conference, and you can come talk to us. We're also hosting a series of roundtables and data dialogues throughout the next year that are open to the public. Uh, but I also recommend diving in and experiencing some of the things that we're building. So we're adding more people to Horizon Worlds every day. And Horizon Workrooms is also a great way to, to experience remote collaboration as it blends sort of the 3D participants in VR with participants dialing in it via VC as well. Um, so I think you can sort of experience what it looks like to, to have people from different surfaces um, in the same social connection. Um, I will also add that we are bringing Microsoft Teams uh, into to workrooms to, to, as an example of sort of how we're thinking about interoperability and, and enabling some of these future use cases. That's so fantastic. So it's not just talk. We are really, you know, uh, as Anne indicated, uh, there is just this open dialogue and collaboration emerging. And I want to point to, if we could put, a, put the, the slide up, uh, the one that uh, I want to highlight today and encourage everyone to express interest in taking part at this roundtable. This is going to take place between 6th to 10th of December and most likely on 10th of December, which is Human Rights Day. And uh, it's an XR data classification roundtable uh, that is also supported by Meta Facebook Reality Lab. Um, and uh, I encourage everyone to express your interest so that we can invite you to take part where all these civic society, XRA and ITIF and all of these other folks are meeting and discussing. We need to understand the context of the data that is going to be flying around in the metaverse. With that said, uh, uh, Elise, according to you, any like any concluding thoughts or key takeaways that you want to the audience to remember? I think that you know we're talking really optimistically and we're really excited about this, but baking safety into the metaverse is going to be hard. 
There's going to be growing pains. Um, but I think that, like Joan said, we are at the point now where we can do the most that we possibly can do to preemptively prepare uh, for a safe and inclusive metaverse. I think it's about bringing people to the table. I think it's about bringing policymakers up to speed. And I think it's about getting excited. This is an amazing technology. It has incredible potential to change the way that we communicate and interact with each other and the world around us. And I don't think uh, if any of us want to lose sight of that when we're thinking about some of these uh, less optimistic things and the potential harms for these technologies. Excellent. And Joan, what about you? Any concluding thoughts or takeaways for everyone? And I know you already mentioned the X track, right? Yes, yes. Um, I, I think from my perspective, um, I, I sort of bring that, uh, that Capitol Hill perspective because I, I work with the lawmakers a lot. Um, law tends to be behind technology. Um, legislation tends to always be catching up. Uh, and there are m multiple reasons for that. Um, so, you know, as everyone here has said, it's important to make sure that uh, people in policymaking positions understand the technology. Um, not that they need a computer science degree, they don't need to understand it at that level, uh, but they need to understand it enough to know what the risks and opportunities are. Um, that said, we don't have to wait for the government to set the parameters, set the standards, and create laws uh, on how this, how this space will be governed. It's important that, that government does play a role, I think, and um, I think most people would agree that it would be a positive for the US if we had a national privacy law, for example. We've got a patchwork of state laws right now. Um, it's very hard in terms of compliance uh, for businesses, and especially smaller ones. Um, but as I said, you know, the, the legislation often is a few steps behind the reality, uh, especially in fast-moving technology. Um, so I think, just to everyone's point here, having conversations like this, putting them into action, as Elise said, um, through things like the XR um, Advisory Council, that's just one example of many, but having these conversations and coming together to decide how, what do we want this space to look like? What, do we, what values do we want to have? What are going to be the parameters? What are going to be some of the rules? Uh, we can all play a part in developing that. Um, and then hopefully, hopefully that informs lawmakers as they are thinking through this and codifying things. But we don't have to wait. The, the direction should come from us, I feel, um, and we don't need to wait from the direction from outside from Capitol Hill. I agree completely. And just one last slide I want to put up there is, uh, before I open up for questions, is XR Safety Week, XRSI. I mean, we need to collaborate, and this is your opportunity. Uh, at XRSI, we believe XR safety is a shared responsibility. And December 6th to 10th, you can play your part by being part of this XR Safety Week. That's when the data classification roundtable is going to take place. We encourage all of you to either be a sponsor, be a community partner. If you're an individual artist, showcase your NFTs, whatever you can do, send a tweet out and support this week before all of us, you know, with our money, go ahead and buy these new headsets during the holidays, it's like a point of reflection that we've created. So with that, you know, uh, before we conclude, I want to just open it up to anyone, you know, who has a question. And I believe there is the mic uh, in the center. You can walk up to it and please go ahead and ask your question. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, hi, my name is Danby. I'm a product manager on the GeoData platform team at Niantic. Um, I love the topic of policy and governance for data and GeoData. Um, I think about that a lot. And it's something that we think about um, in terms of privacy, um, tracking. Um, you know, we made Pokemon Go, so a lot of people are always like, well, you can't really play the game if you turn off your location services. Um, the whole point is to walk outside and do stuff outside. But um, we may have partners that maybe don't care so much about governance or policy or future impact of technology on how we perceive the world. Um, you know, not everyone's going to find governance sexy. So my question is, 
how should we engage with folks and partners who just don't care or don't think that that's exciting enough to think about? Wow, and it's a tough one. <laughs> who wants to take that? <laughs> how do we get people excited? I, I think if you can uh, help them uh, from a business standpoint, if you can help um, folks to understand that there needs to be a positive relationship with their user, with their consumer, um, and if their customers don't, um, don't trust them and think that they really don't care about policy, uh, that might be a negative for them. Um, and then on the flip side, in, in terms of users who don't think policy is particularly sexy, I think you can always remind them that it, it, you know, this does actually have an impact on your life. So it's, uh, you know, if you can bring it down to that personal level and help them to understand how these, these have tangible, policy has tangible impact. It's not, it's not something totally abstract. Um, at least that's the way I would approach it. And first of all, I think policy is always sexy, but I know that's not <laughs> what everyone thinks. Um, and because of that, I think, you know, some of the work that, uh, again, I'll say XRI and XRSI are doing is to create baseline frameworks and standards. So people don't have to reinvent the wheel every time you tell them you should think about governance. So making sure that we have best practices in place, that we have industry standards in place, uh, and making sure that folks like Niantic and others who do care about governance are feeding into that discussion. That way when people might not be as excited about it, at least you can tell them, okay, well here are at least some boxes you have to check. Mm -hmm. Right, and, and I don't know if you have any input yeah. to that. I would love to add something. I, there's the power of narrative and the power of VR itself, I think, in storytelling are something to, to help with this. Uh, I think just getting people access to that technology and showing them why it was meaningful to you can get people to think about like the benefits, but also the risks. And then once once they're at that level, um, it's it's helpful to to bring them along on the journey. So one of the ways that we do that is is design jams, and we involve engineers in in these processes as well because um, it's often this collaborative. All oh, right, let's imagine the risk. Let's imagine the solutions. And having those perspectives is is very helpful. And seeing how others think about these problems and these technologies can really sprout um, that solution discovery process. Yeah, thank I, you. I, I second all of that, but one more thing that I want to add is something that I heard from um, uh, our marketing advisor, and she no longer serves as a marketing advisor, but I still really respect her opinion. She told me once, she's like, Kavya, you're, you're taking on a lot, and this is all the dry topic. You're going to have to make knowledge sexy. <laughs> And so at XRSI, we are constantly trying to make knowledge sexy, making like virtual wars and inviting people into those amazing, compelling virtual wars to talk about safety and security, building frameworks and inviting you know, people to contribute to that knowledge. And then just like collaborating with, with folks that are artists, uh, NFT artists, We're doing NFT auctions. We did like, you know, uh, some kind of a golf outing to just to inspire people to think about safety. So those are just, you know, some mechanism to make knowledge sexy and talk about policy in the way that we believe it is. It is really hot. <laughs> I don't know if I'd agree with that. <laughs> um, yeah, so um, there are often industry days on Capitol Hill where different industries uh, talk to their representatives, to the senators and the and people that are creating governance and policy. Um, I think technology and technologists, uh, that industry tends to be, outside of the mega corporations, pretty blissfully unaware of those interactions and those conversations. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if, if any of you are hearing uh, a request to create one of those kinds of days or a week on the Hill um, so this is kind of a two-parter. There's, there's that. And then also the opportunity there where, you know, we've seen this often where agencies that don't have industry best practices or even aren't aware of existing framework spend billions of max, uh, American taxpayer dollars building and rebuilding systems that many of us in the room probably could have built on the first or second try. Um, so there's kind of a mixed bag there of questions. One is, how can we get on the hill and talk to our reps and make change occur? And the other one is, 
opportunity. What opportunities do you all see in improving the way things are built? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dennis, and uh, thank you for that question. And, and I know we have two amazing experts who are literally working at the Hill, so I think you guys are really well-equipped to like, you know, answer that question. Do we need to create some kind of a deliberate effort to like, pull people into it or you know, make that space? So I can take the second part of your question. Uh, one thing that IHIF has consistently recommended is um, getting XR more directly involved in government procurement processes, uh, especially to set things like baseline standards for privacy and accessibility. So it's actually a win-win situation. You know, government procurement offices will set standards that comply with laws that require them to have certain data privacy and accessibility standards, and then people can build, they, they'll create a market, right, for new content and new uh, materials that they can use in XR. And hopefully that becomes, you know, a universal thing. And like you said, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel every time an agency wants an XR program. So integrating it into like actually base level government procurement processes is, I know we just said policy isn't sexy, but and <laughs> government procurement is less sexy, but this is actually a thing where uh, it could play a really big role. Um, I'm sure Joan can take the Hill stuff, though. Yes, I'm actually thrilled with that question. It's <laughs> as if I told you to ask it, which I didn't. I didn't. Um, you can join the XR Association, um, and that's how you can get in front of lawmakers. Uh, I mean, obviously, there are other ways, but um, part of what I do is try and connect uh, our members with lawmakers um, you know, to, to talk about what they're doing, how, and not, not just selling a widget. You know, that, that's, we don't do earmarks and all of that sort of thing, but to help them understand maybe their role, their company's role in this bigger picture of XR and what it is and how it's going to impact society. Um, we work very hard to, as I said earlier, r raise awareness and help lawmakers at least uh, to some extent understand what this technology is. Uh, we had a big accomplishment um, early in the summer this year where we successfully lobbied to have immersive technology uh, which means AR, VR, and MR <clears throat> included in a bill called the Endless Frontier Act. Um, for those of you who are wonky hill people, I don't know if anyone here follows this stuff. Um, it's now called the U.S. Innovation and Competition Act. It was a bill introduced by Senator Schumer uh, with the intent to really pick up investment in research and development in the most important emerging technologies. They listed uh, 10 key technology focus areas in that bill. And we were successful in getting immersive technologies listed there. So it's a big breakthrough. Um, and and um, if the bill ultimately passes, which we are optimistic it will, uh, it will mean more research and development dollars uh, for, uh, it's, uh, sky's the limit, to three trillion. No, I don't know. Um, <laughs> uh, we're in the spending mood, no. Um, it will mean real research and development advances. Um, but that, I, I say all of that just to say that we are making inroads. Uh, we're getting uh, lawmakers to recognize the importance of this technology and the impact that it's going to have. And I know we have just a few minutes left and you know, I can see people standing up to ask the questions. We'll take questions, you know, we can speak afterwards as well. One thing I do want to add to Joan's uh, response to, uh, at XRSI, I actually just got back from my two months trip from Europe on behalf of XRSI. I met a lot of stakeholders in Europe, some of the governments, you know, we were at the Swiss parliament and I was in Denmark, I was in Italy, like talking to all these global regulators to try to help them understand this thing. And that is precisely what's going to happen during XR Safety Week, which is also supported by Aust government of Australia, eSafety Commissioner, one of the very first regulators that has taken the baton to regulate online interactions and so we are helping them align uh, their you know safety by design tools with XR and so those are the kind of efforts that you know you can be part of XRSI or contribute and you know that ways this will open up interaction at the global level there is a very fantastic announcement that I'm not going to mention today but tomorrow we have another panel <laughs> at 9 a.m. Uh, it's going to be about safeguarding the metaverse as well. And I think we might, uh, you might hear something really exciting there, too. Uh, one more question, I guess. We are kind of out of time, but quickly. Uh, my name is Ahmed. I'm a computing student from Australia. So I'm actually happy that 
Australia was mentioned in the previous uh, announcement. Um, I have a question to Meta specifically. Um, when there is conflict between, um, I guess, like the greater good of the users of Horizon or whatever metaverse is going to be created and generating money, how do you choose the, the I guess, the um, preserving or protecting the users over the revenue? So for example, with Facebook, the longer you spend on the platform, the more money is going to be generated from the platform. Uh, but that also generates sort of addiction as well. So how, I guess, how, with the creation of the metaverse, how do you avoid sort of addictions? How do you avoid um, uh, compromising people's uh, freedoms and whatnot for the sake of uh, profit? Thanks, Ahmed, for the question. I really appreciate it. Uh, one of the ways that we're approaching this, and you raised a, a number of issues, all of which I think uh, are part of the open questions that we're hoping to get uh, input and feedback on from a variety of stakeholders. Um, but one of the things that ways that we're sort of thinking about this and squaring this circle is, in, is ensuring that there are early ways for, especially within Horizon Worlds, um, creators to, to get engaged uh, and, and to basically give value, put people first um, for those creators. And so we announced the, the creator fund there's a couple of aspects of that, one of which is, is community competitions, there's the accelerator program, and there's also funding for developers. So it's very clear that, and, and we've done this a lot through, through the um, existing VR platform, that we need to bring folks along, we need to have opportunities for developers to, to, to make money and to, to really uh, ensure that, that they have opportunities in addition to the people that are using our platform. But I, I, every issue that you raised is something that we're thinking about and something that uh, we need to and continue to invest in. Um, but that's one of the ways that we're doing that, the Horizon, the Horizon Creators Fund. Yeah, and I think, Anne, we talked about it, the trade-offs that we make, and when those trade-offs are made, we need to have all these voices together to make those trade-offs. Rachel, do we have time for one more question, or we're totally out? No, I think, unfortunately, we all have right. to Let's, stop yeah. here. Sorry, Abe.